Welcome to The Cabral Concept, where board-certified doctor of naturopathy, Dr. Stephen Cabral, shares with you exactly how you can reverse aging, take back your health, and live a life full of energy and passion with new 20-minute episodes every single day to keep you healthy and engaged. Now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Cabral. Welcome, everybody. Great to have you back here today on The Cabral Concept. Today's episode is 2750. If you want to follow along for all the details, I'll be talking about chronotypes today. If you've never heard about that, it will explain those that are night owls and they like to wake up a little bit later, those that like to go to bed earlier and wake up earlier, and kind of the genetics and maybe constitutions behind that as well. But then I'll also give you a breakdown and just a quick breakdown on cortisol and melatonin and how they actually work with nature in the environment. I just taught this inside of High Performance Health, Module 8, which we go over um, deep sleep protocols, REM protocols, uh, non-sleep deep rest protocols that are called NSDR. And really, that entire um, certification or course is called High Performance Health. And it's just dedicated to helping people live past 100 healthily. And so the goal is like, the goal is 100 now. It really is. It's not 74 years for men trying to beat that or 77 years for women in the United States. Um, But it's actually to increase health span and in lifespan as long as we can. So with health span, it's the number of healthy years you have in life. In the US, it's basically like 35 to 40. And then all of a sudden, people go on medications now for everything. And we see it actually happen in children, which is too bad. Right? It's just, it's awful. And my, my goal is to try to teach every day to, to help prevent that, you know, as much as we can, as much as I can. And then lifespan, again, is how long you live. So in the blue zones, let's say that a person lives uh, 100 years. Well, they're going to live 99, 99 and a half healthy years. And the last three, six months of their life, they're unhealthy and then they pass away. Um, and that's that's health span really lasting as long as lifespan. That's what we want. And then in an ideal world, it's just we live a long, healthy life and we pass away in our sleep. Like that's that's I don't know. I think for most people, that's kind of like the ultimate goal. Like you have a you have a great day. You have a great day. You put your head on the pillow, and and then that that was it. You know, it's like not in a bad way. We're not immortal. Not that I know of. Um, but the thing is, part of part of death is also appreciating then life. And if you don't ever have a mortality, then you might not get to appreciate each and every day that we have right here. And since nobody knows how long they're going to have, I don't know how long I have, right? Nobody does. Just do your best to appreciate today. That's really what it's all about. But there are so many people out there, again, who look at sleep differently. And I talked about this inside of high performance health. It's like they try to get as little sleep as possible. And like, it's like some type of badge of honor. It's not. When you know the disposable soma theory and you understand part of aging, it's the understanding that the body prioritizes reproduction first, reproductive years. And it's going to try to do its best to keep you healthy on the front end, right? The operating system on the front end, the human organism through about 40 years old. And then what happens is hormones begin to lower. But at the same time, the repair, the damage has been done because you haven't been repairing over those years as much because you've been trying to boost hormones, uh, boost libido, boost energy, all the things just to like continue to carry on the species. I have a whole podcast on disposable soma theory and so much more. I'm happy to link that up here today. This is episode 2750 at stephencabral.com forward slash podcast is episode 2750. But um, again, a lot of people overlook sleep. And we know that you need seven to nine hours of sleep every single night. And I can't go through who needs what right now. I have a podcast on that as well. But there are people that are just trying to say, well, I don't need as much sleep because they feel totally fine. It's just not true. Like you need 90 minutes of deep or more and you need two hours of REM or more. Deep is basically repairing the body and and, uh, the REM sleep is repairing the mind. And so these things are needed for bodily health, cardiovascular, blood pressure, diabetes, et cetera. We know if you sleep less, then you're more prone to all of those and stroke and diabetes and cardiovascular disease and heart attacks. And if you don't get enough REM sleep, you're more prone to Alzheimer's and dementia. So again, we know these things. We have to understand the importance of it. All right. There's one more point to this. Seven to nine hours a night, just shoot for eight, you know, shoot for eight. You'll be in the middle. You'll, if you just need a place to start and then try to track your sleep if possible. 
my ring is charging right now. You can actually see the tan line on my finger. That's kind of funny, but you have to, I charge my uh, Oura ring as well, which is what I use. I can link that up today since it's not a supplement and we're not talking about, well, I guess we are talking about disease, but I can link that up. So I will link up what I use at stevencabral.com slash 2750. We'll keep it at that. You know the URL now, I'll move on. All right, so here's the thing though. Um, so important that you're getting the deep, you're getting the REM, but it's also timing. The lowest your cortisol is going to be is somewhere between nine and 10 at night, most uh, seasons of the year, even summertime. It's a couple hours after the sun sets. So earlier in the winter, a little later in the summer, but it's about nine to 10. Like in the winter, you could say, oh, I'm gonna go to bed a little bit earlier, sunsets earlier. That would be totally fine. So I've talked about that. I've talked about how many hours to fast before bed. Uh, again, we can link up these podcasts for you. If you ever need help, you can't find a podcast. There are 2,750 of them. Go to cabralsupportgroup.com, ask your question there. We'll find it for you. We're happy to help. And so the thing is, if the lowest level of stress hormone and energy hormone is between nine and 10, good idea to go to bed between that time. If the highest levels of cortisol between six and eight in the morning, good idea to rise during that time for natural energy. No grogginess. Going to bed with the moon, waking up with the sun. Whether you're a night owl or not, I'm gonna explain that in just a moment because there are variations. I'm not going to say there's not. If you were in nature, right, you were, you were pre a couple thousand years ago, you didn't have uh, drapes or blinds or blackout shades or whatever you want to call it in your house, right? I guess that was only like a few hundred years ago. Then, but even if you had a roof, you'd still have the sun shining in through your window. Okay, we'll put it that way. Best example is you go camping in nature. Within three weeks, you would completely change your own circadian rhythm to match that of nature. Because you might not fall asleep till midnight or 1 a.m. the first couple nights, but when you're waking up to the sun around 5, 6 a.m. in the morning, you're gonna start to get really tired by eight or nine o'clock at night, especially if you've only been sleeping from one to five, right? You'll, you'll reset pretty quick. You'll start to fall asleep around nine o'clock or so at night, you'll start waking up around five to six. It's a nice eight to nine hours of sleep. So that is the best time to sleep. There are studies called the nurses study. There's a lot more showing that your all cause mortality goes up by 15%. All chance of dying from everything or anything goes up by 15% <coughs> if you're not getting sleep during the 10 and 2 a.m. hour during like a night shift, all right? So again, all of this is scientifically proven. If this interests you, if you like the human body, if you wanna live longer, if you wanna learn about advanced anti-aging protocols, you can head on over to highperformancehealth.org and check it out. All right, but let's get into these types because there are variations, there's no doubt about it. And I don't wanna say that there aren't. So there are what are called four chronotypes. Chronotype is basically just like a body clock within you. It's a natural rhythm. Some people prefer going to bed a little bit later, some a little bit earlier. There is a little bit to that. Now, I do have to say that I think this is manipulated a little bit more by nurture than it is nature. Nature is more genetic predisposition and nurture is just based on environment. For example, in college, I went to bed much later let's say around 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night. On the weekends, I would go to bed at like 3 a.m., right? Like a lot of college students. Not the healthiest thing to do, but then again, I was in college and nobody was gonna tell me to go to bed, you know, at 11 p.m. on Friday night or Saturday night, right? So like, it is what it is. I was a different human back then. Uh, but even after that, you know, I started to go to bed later when I was able to if I was working later in the morning. So that was that and I enjoyed that. I had a good time with that. I, my uh, wife and I ate dinner later at night. We went to bed later, all those different things. We were able to, right? So here's the thing though. Now I go to bed between 9.30 and 10, and I wake up between 5.30 and 6. And I feel just as good as I did then. I actually feel better now, right? So like, is that, am I a night owl? Well, I could have said I was a night owl back then. It's because I was doing, like your body adapts really well, all right? So that's what I want to state about that. But let me go through the four chronotypes and I'll let you decide for yourself. The first one is this, it's called a lark. So the lark prefers early mornings, right? It's just nicknamed the lark. They prefer early mornings, they like to wake up uh, earlier and they wake up typically with energy. They're morning people, they're more productive the first half of the day. Typically tend to go to bed earlier. They sometimes, oftentimes they're more energetic. They have a positive outlook on life, lower levels of anxiety and depression. 
I've seen this in my own practice. So I'm kind of sharing with you um, not only what they've found in the research, I'm kind of doing that in air quotes because I want to be careful with how we're labeling people because people can change, right? Um, but I've definitely found this in my own practice. And, and for sure, uh, I'm one of those people at least now. Like you couldn't say that back in the day because I could easily work later in the day, right? So for sure now, <clears throat> I don't have anxiety. I don't have impression, d- depression. Very happy about that. When I was sick, yeah, I definitely did. Now, not so much, right? So like it, things in life can change. So never think that you are a static human being and you're gonna be this way for the rest of your life. Okay, so um, that's that. The next one is the exact opposite. This is the evening chronotype instead of the morning chronotype. This is called the owl, night owl, right? That's how they got that name. So they prefer late nights. They often feel more energetic and productive in the afternoon or evening. Tend to go to bed later and they often have difficulty with waking up earlier or morning-based activities. Uh, They can definitely be more creative uh, and open to new experiences, but they can also struggle with what I spoke about before, which is depression and anxiety um, and basically outlook on life. So, you know, these are people that don't necessarily like to commit to the nine to five work hours and more of a night owl. I'll be coming back to that one in just a moment. There's one called an intermediary or intermediate chronotype. And it kind of falls between the, (coughs) excuse me, falls between the morning and the evening uh, with more flexibility and how they wake throughout the day. More of a traditional sleep schedule. Then they might go to bed more like 10 o'clock at night, maybe 11 o'clock, wake up at like six to seven in the morning. Now, fairly uh, adaptive to morning routines or evening. They could go out to maybe, you know, a later dinner one night, not be tired, uh, wake up a little later in the morning the next day, and then get back on their normal schedule. So that's more of the intermediate type. They're uh, don't necessarily have a strong preference. They do it based on like work schedule, those types of things. They're pretty flexible. Instead of an intermediate type, I would call them more of like the flexible chronotype. And then there's the afternoon chronotype. The afternoon, like we just, again, when you're looking at the, the research behind this, they're just trying to include everybody, right? Okay, we've got the afternoon type. And this is where peak energy and productivity happen more in the afternoon uh, or maybe late morning. So early afternoon, late morning, this is more the uh, afternoon chronotype. I was definitely this person person when I had Addison's disease because I was a complete zombie until like 11 or 12, uh, 11 in the morning, 12 noon. And then I would start to get a little bit of energy and then I was good. And then of course I couldn't fall asleep at night. So this is a very interesting one because um, they find both mornings and evenings difficult, right? So I did too. Like I couldn't sleep at night and I was groggy all morning. And the only time I really felt good was from like 11 a.m. to like 4 p.m. I mean, that's five hours. It's not a very good out of 24 hour schedule, right? So this is important to look at. I wanted to share this with you in a little different light because a lot of people write books about chronotypes. They tell you how to adapt your schedule. In my opinion, and I wouldn't say it's opinion because I can back it up through real science and Ayurvedic medicine, anything but the flexible chronotype and the lark, which is the morning chronotype, there's the imbalance. So for sure, the evening chronotype has what's called a dysfunctional diurnal rhythm. We humans are not nocturnal. We are easy prey at night. If you were to walk outside or walk in a jungle at night, you would be easy prey. Your eyes do not see well in the light. I mean, in the dark. Mine don't either, right? Easy prey. They like you're not a predator. You're you're just not like, that's not the way humans work. We are absolutely what are called diurnal rhythm beings. We are meant to be awake during the sunlight hours and asleep or resting during the dark ones. We're up essentially between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. And after 6 p.m., we should start to wind down for three hours or so. Um, and then what we, what do we do? Well, we start to get ready for our bedtime routine. That is what humans are naturally meant to do. You put them out in the wilderness. That's what they're going to adapt to. Now there's all sorts of different theories that there was the night watch back in the day and you got those genes. I'm telling you right now, if you look at the actual data and science, you will show, it will show you that even if you feel more creative at night, if, even if you do all these things, if you stay up between the hours of 10 PM 
and 2 a.m., you are most likely going to shorten your life. And that's why I bring it to you from an unbiased perspective, because you know I don't really care if you like to stay up until 12 or 1. I, I wish that you could, and that was good for you, and that you enjoyed that, and that was all going to be fine. But the data doesn't seem to support that. And that's because you're pushing cortisol levels under blue light at night when the sun is not risen in the sky. And then you're sleeping, um, or, or you're not producing melatonin during those hours, because melatonin is not going to produce while cortisol is high, or while you're getting light into your eyes and touching your skin and, and then signaling the pineal gland to not produce right melatonin because it's seeing blue light. And then what happens is you're producing cortisol, the stress hormone, all the way through 1 a.m., 2, 2 a.m., and then you're sleeping during the light hours, which is when you're supposed to get peak cortisol from 6 to 8. So now your thyroid's off, your cortisol's off. Yeah, you're going to be more likely to be depressed and potentially lower energy and anxiety. So I share this with you. It's just something to think about. You don't need to change right away, but I would love you to start to work back that bedtime. I have a whole podcast on it by 15 minutes per week, just slow and steady. Just start to work it back. I'm telling you right now, it is a game changer. But now you know what chronotypes are. You can do with that what you may. If you disagree with me, that's okay. I would love to hear your thoughts, especially if you were watching this on YouTube, right in the comments below. I'd love to hear from you. I really do. I, I enjoy listening to both sides of the argument, having a civil debate, talking like, two people that are just after the truth, because that's all that I'm after. So thank you so much for tuning into today's show. You'll find all the notes, and there will be a lot, uh, as well as all the podcast previous ones to link up to. I can even give you a cortisol test. If you've never run your evening cortisol, we'll link that up today with the stress, mood, and metabolism test, and much more at stephencabral.com slash 2750. Take care, everybody. Have an amazing rest of the day. I'll talk with you tomorrow. Ever wonder what the best sauna, blue blockers, sleep trackers, wake lights, salt lamps, or other health gadgets are? Or what about the top non-toxic mattresses, sheets, soaps, bath products, toothpaste, and cookware? Or would you like to know the cleanest choices for hemp parts, meal delivery services, supplements, and much more? I personally curated, researched, and now created a resource page of all of my top picks that continues to grow each week. These are the exact products I use in my own life, with my family, in my private practice, and they're the ones I trust. To find out all of my up-to-date recommendations and all the details, simply head on over to stephencabral.com forward slash resources.